<sighs> you could have been so much more. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword needs no introduction, I'm sure, but here I go with an introduction. In November 2011, Nintendo released the latest console Zelda game on the Nintendo Wii, one of the last major titles in its lifespan. Coming off the success of Twilight Princess, people were excited about the game as early as from this first piece of promotional art. Much like with Wind Waker, however, half were turned off when they saw the art style in Engine. Too vibrant and kiddy, they wanted it back to being dark and mature like Twilight Princess was, blah blah blah. But none of that really matters matters for this YGPT. This time around, we're all going to accept the fact that Skyward Sword was held back by its hardware, because it was. And I don't need any of you rabid Zelda fans already breaking off of your chains and commenting about how Skyward Sword was a great game, and that the Wii specs were competitive, and console wars, and uh, any of that other crap. You'll be adding a lot more to the context of this video than I intend to add. These are the two true facts. The Wii, architecturally, was vastly inferior technology to its competition. Nintendo favored the novelty of optical motion capture instead of raw power from components like RAM, rendering, engine compatibility, and processor strength. The other true fact is that Skyward Sword was in development for over five years and finally appeared on Wii the year before the Wii U released. Miyamoto was pressured with all this unfinished work and rushed it out on dated forgotten hardware. Good or bad, this game would have been better developed if it moved to the Wii U. Imagine how awesome that would have been. So with all that said, let's examine what the Wii runs on and why this made Skyward Sword the way it was. Perhaps this may shed more light on why some people love the game, whereas others hate it. Firstly, we can safely assume the Wii's central specification, the sensor bar and wireless motion tech, was conceived with the Zelda franchise in mind. When Project Revolution, the Wii, was announced back in 2005 and Iwata told us all about what it was and what it means, the first thing everyone thought was, I want to be Link and swing a sword. So that part of the Wii's hardware is obvious in how it influenced Skyward Sword. However, the technology was inferior as soon as it was released, because as we all know, the Wii sensor is not capable of reading sophisticated movements and has too much latency to be perfectly spot on. Nintendo had this idea for sword combat and kicked the Wii out in front of everyone, knowing it couldn't do what everyone wanted, so they had to get to work on Motion Plus to perfect that technology. This, I assume, was the main obstacle Miyamoto faced in developing the game. For nearly two years, he couldn't even get the main game mechanic to work the way he wanted. The second biggest design challenge I would guess the development team faced was linearity versus open world level designs. I think Skyward Sword's hub world design and linear branching areas were influenced mainly by time constraints, but another plausible cause was hardware related. The Wii Remote and Nunchuck, the only combination suitable for an action game utilizing Motion Plus, has no freeform option of camera control. This was also a glaring flaw in Mario Galaxy's design and in Skyward Sword it's no different. I want to look around, but if I want to, I have to press C on my nunchuck and look around in first person, edge scrolling as my sword jitters around like a phone on vibrate. Nintendo's games usually have so much polish and tone. This looks rough and beta-y. It's ugly and, you're all gonna hate this one, stupid. If Miyamoto had his way, the camera control would have been smooth and nice like Twilight Princess, or Wind Waker's was, Wiimote and Nunchuck. Fault of the hardware, not the game. Let's look at what's under the hood, shall we? Yes, we're peering into hell itself. The very juices that curdle in the bowels of the console wars. We're going to examine the Wii's system specifications. That's right, console specs. So the Wii was... Well, it was a total tyke compared to the PS3 and Xbox 360 during its time. So we'll make this comparison pretty short so we can get a general idea of what the Wii was capable of when it came to running games. The Wii ran on a single core IBM microprocessor clocked at about 700 megahertz. The Wii had about 88 megabytes of system RAM, GPU speed clocked at next to nothing, and had a capped resolution of 640x480. You could gain some extra resolution if you went interlaced, but, you know, 
interlaced. Compare that to the competition, where tri-core processors were the minimum, HD resolutions at the least were natively created for the software, GPU speed was double that of Nintendo's creation, and on top of over triple the system RAM, the PS3 even had dedicated VRAM, giving it a huge edge in rendering graphics and in-engine cutscenes. One interesting thing to note is that Xbox 360 and the Wii had the exact same disc capacity, meaning we can assume that the scope of Skyward Sword was never overestimated at any point in development. The entirety of Skyward Sword would fit just as well on a disc made for Microsoft's machine. It's nice to know that the entire experience was there from beginning to end. However, this lack of RAM, low graphical fidelity, and processor power severely held back Skyward Sword. Imagine if the game could run in full HD picture at 60 frames per second. Not only would graphics in the distance not look smudgy and pixelated, which the watercolor art style was implemented in order to cover up, but that would have greatly increased the screen's depth of field, meaning the game could have been designed more open world and relied less on guidance tools like beacons and dowsing, which would have cut down on the tutorial in the beginning of the game. Hey, how's about that? They'd be establishing actual flow. The swordplay would have been more responsive under a stable frame rate as well. With only a single core of processing and 88 megabytes of shared RAM between the game and the Wii's OS, there's very little that can be done in terms of game design. The Wii has 88 megabytes of memory, I want to emphasize that. That is not a lot to work with. The Xbox 360 had 512 megabytes of RAM. That's almost six times as much data that can be stored at any one time. This difference in RAM lends a lot to why Wii games are so much smaller in every way compared to the other consoles, or at least, if not smaller, definitely more fragmented. It's why you didn't see a lot of open-world games on it. You'll never ever see more than maybe 10 enemies in any room unless they're smaller and simpler looking, or if they're far in the distance of the screen, maybe. Thanks to that poor processor performance and the minimal RAM, Room design for dungeons were also very limited. Switches, movable blocks, enemies, triggers for Phi telling you a stupid thing about something obvious. These all had to be loaded into that measly 88 megabytes of memory, or else the game would lag. Compare the processor to the competition, and it's plain to see why games like Dark Souls and Dead Rising were possible only outside of Nintendo territory. On top of more dedicated VRAM, more RAM overall, more processor cores and clock speeds over five times faster than the Wii, making multi-platform hits just for the Xbox 360 and PS3 made more sense as one would produce a more technologically sophisticated game without having to spend extra money creating a dumbed-down Wii port of it, let alone taking the time to figure out how to make such a grandiose game run on such a meek system, or how to make sure your new custom engine runs on the Wii's APIs, or if you'll have to include a proprietary API to supplement the game, which will tax the Wii's processor even more, and... Oh, it's no wonder so few developers worked on this thing. It sounds like it would have been a headache. Ever look into a bottled beverage in the fridge and then look at the glass you pulled out of the cupboard and think, yeah, that'll all fit. Then you stupidly hold the bottle upside down, pour sloppily, and then realize your glass was actually too small. You end up with this sticky, fizzy mess spilling outside the boundaries of what was set before you. It's not really a big deal, and once you clean up the mess, you still have a decent drink. But you're just kinda left pissy and embarrassed because it was you that chose the glass. It was you that wanted the drink in that glass. You spelled out your own disappointment. Yeah. And I think a lot of us that were disappointed with it really do have no one to blame but ourselves. It was on Nintendo Wii, and it did have that one-to-one -one combat we were talking about, but any hardcore Nintendo fan already knew that the next console was in development. And to hype up something so excessively when we all knew that it probably was not going to be as good as anything that would be on the successor, who else is there to blame? Take into account that the game was in development for a long time, there were countless potholes Miyamoto probably faced in getting it from start to finish. Miyamoto probably didn't even care how the game turned out and was surprised when everyone liked it. If anything, he was probably just excited that the game released. And you know what? Maybe at the end of the day, we should all just be glad that it released too. So with that, maybe there's a reason why you've gotta play this. See you all in a couple months. Hey, glad I could see you here at the end of the video. If you liked what you saw, be sure to hit the like button. And if you are new here and have not yet, be sure to subscribe for more awesome content in the future. You know, you give, uh, you receive. That's how it works here on YouTube. Uh, there's a very strong bartering system of video content. Uh, just make sure you hit like and subscribe. I think I'm going to be doing a bit more of these uh, from now on, uh, promoting that is. Uh, you know, to assume that that sort of behavior is below me uh, is kind of 
playing into the whole condescending attitude that I thought it created in the first place. So, you know, why not just, you know, advertise a bit more? Um, you know, be sure to just remind people to uh, hit like and subscribe. Uh, might even put some uh, silent uh, visual aids on uh, videos from now on, or maybe in the uh, next upcoming weeks. Uh, run the idea by you guys first. I don't want to, you know, come off as pandering if you guys aren't okay with that. Um, but otherwise, I'm probably going to. If you guys like this music, I'm going to be throwing these end slates into uh, YGPT videos from now on as well once the new season airs in March. Huh? Uh, I love this music. I feel like we're out at a, a French cafe together and we're... Um, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't finish that sentence. Can't tell you guys what the next YGPT is going to be about yet, but uh, I guarantee you guys are probably going to think it's pretty darn cool. I've got some awesome new ideas already cooking up, but uh, of course you guys won't be able to see them for a couple more months, so make sure you stay tuned. Again, like and subscribe. You will get the notifications as they come. Thanks again, guys. Peace.